And we have great potential here with all the lightning and, and the big winds to make a fire big in a hurry if you have fuel. When the Trout Creek, the Holloway fire destroyed age old sagebrush on the Trout Creeks and probably didn't do the sage grouse lex any good, it kind of opened everybody's eyes to the mega fire issue, how, how big the fires can get in this area. The Harney County Wildfire Collaborative. It's a diverse group of agency folks, both federal and state and county government folks, as well as private landowners and members of rangeland fire protection associations. The Harney County Wildfire Collaborative was built in three phases. The first phase was the suppression phase where folks uh, discussed better tactics to deal with wildfires. We hate to see these big ones that start and, and don't quit for 70 miles. Here it comes. There were a lot of conflicts between private landowners and agency personnel, both federal and state agency personnel. We had some real issues on the first few years of fighting fire between us and the feds. Some really good partnerships were formed. Uh, there was a liaison hired that dealt with the Rangeland Fire Protection Association communications with the BLM and other federal agencies and how the responses uh, to wildfires were going to be handled in the future. And probably more importantly, the relationships were built. So a new level of trust and um, some of the anger and adversity that had occurred as a result of those fires was resolved. We helped the feds in a lot of ways with uh, even if they just got one of the local guys on their crew that can tell them where water resources are, where roads are, where fences are, where, where places to, to attack a fire can be hand, uh, it's, it's really beneficial to them. High Desert Partnership put together the collaborative uh, model that's helped us to, uh, to work through some pretty difficult issues. So the relationships built through collaboration allow parties that wouldn't necessarily trust each other prior to sitting in a room for 18 months to two years to accomplish things that outside of collaboration probably wouldn't reach agreement. More often than not, it's surprising the common ground that can be found, the shared values. But after you sit in a collaborative situation and you listen to everybody's side of the coin, you can see their, their view too. There's more sides to a coin than anybody realizes. Finding common ground um, is really the, the equivalent of trust. And every time you come to the table, and you may walk away from the table, but if you come back, every time you come to the table, you put a coin in the trust bucket. When you get enough money in the trust bucket, uh, you get to a point where episodic change begins to happen, and all of a sudden, everybody agrees enough on a plan to move forward in an effective manner. Collaborative communication is a good thing. People helping people, people getting along with people is, is a good, great thing. Sometime in 2017, we moved into the prevention phase of the collaborative. And that's when the group started talking about building fire breaks and other uh, means to de decrease response time. We first started looking across the whole Burns BLM district. And then we honed in on areas that were priority areas for sage grouse and we worked with natural resource professionals from the BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. The Pueblos ultimately rose to the top because in recent history there had been no large-scale fires there, and it was the largest, most intact piece of habitat in the Burns District of the BLM. The purpose of the Pueblo pilot study is pretty simple. There's a piece of geography south um, and, and west of, of Fields, Oregon, uh, that's pretty important to a number of different groups. Mule deer, bighorn sheep, and a variety of other wildlife species. It's not just about wildlife, it's about maintaining the, the grazing for the permitted operators in those areas. It's a very intact landscape. There's not a lot of man-made features in that part of the world. And there's about a million acres of what you might call a sagebrush sea. When you start looking around the west, in the northern Great Basin, and particularly with annual grasses and the increase in fire and the low elevations, there's not many chunks of ground that big, that intact, that are left in the northern Great Basin. And what we're trying to do in the pilot study is to create a fuel break uh, that 
helps us to keep large fires out of the area. You can think of the Pueblo project as the low elevation part and the high elevation part. It's got two very distinct ecologically uh, segments to it. And the low elevation part, there was a fire that was used to remove the shrubs. The higher elevation part, there was uh, mechanical means, mowing that was used to reduce the shrubs. And there's a reason that fire was used in the low elevation part. We also needed to get rid of the annual grasses because they create really high fuel continuity as opposed to native perennial bunch grasses which tend to be widely spaced and it's much more difficult to carry a fire through those plant communities. That's what we want. We want a native perennial bunch grass community there. There's a really easy way to think about the effects of cheatgrass. Imagine, if you will, that sagebrush is a bomb. Now, in order to light a bomb, you need a fuse. In this case, cheatgrass is not only the fuse, but it is an insanely long fuse that connects all of the sagebrush. You can get 20, 30 foot flame lengths, I mean, if, if you've got the right type of fuel in sagebrush country. Poker Jim last year gobbled up 70 miles of terrain in 13 hours, you know. The treatments themselves are, are fairly straightforward. The biggest challenge is going to be logistical. Well, we're working in the middle of nowhere. We do what's called a burn plan, and the burn plan has a number of things in it. We have a prescription for the, the fire itself. The burn plan outlines all the resource objectives that we're trying to meet out here. These study plots, we try to put some good fire by them. We're conducting a 890-acre control burn. Currently, we're working on securing around our control plots. It comes around, runs the base of the hill a little bit. Black lines where we go in and we put fire on the ground intentionally to create a black area that the main fire won't carry through. By putting the black line around it, it's unburnable and it'll keep fire out of the main control plot. Afterwards, we'll be able to tell what effect the fire had versus the areas that have had no fire in them. If you want to kill annual grasses, if you want to take them out of a plant community, one of the most effective ways to do that is a pre-emergent herbicide. Pre-emergent herbicides are herbicides that are best sprayed onto bare soil and they kill any plant that emerges through the soil. How do you do that? Well, in this case we used fire and fire was an effective pre-treatment for applying the pre-emergent herbicide which then in turn controlled the annual grasses. Bare dirt likes to grow plants and without further intervention from you know somebody, it's going to be cheatgrass that grows back. We're going to place native seed in that this uh, fall, this winter, and try to get desirable vegetation that uh, is spaced out more so than what you see with cheatgrass. And so it should create, it should maintain this fuel break that we've now created, uh, hopefully for quite a while so that we don't have to come back year after year to apply treatment. Three different actions going on. There's the fire piece, and then there'll be an herbicide piece, and then a planting piece. So I'm in range science and there's a lot of things I like about it, but there's some baggage. And one of the things is that you're never gonna be one of those scientists that gets to scream Eureka. Because the problems that, that we face are what we call complex problems. And complex problems vary in space and time, but complex problems also tend to be chronic. So it's, if you can think of a disease that's gonna stick with a person for the rest of their life, that can be treated but not cured, the low elevation portion of this project is likely to be like that. It will always need some level of monitoring. There's grazing that goes on. So what's the response of the plant community to grazing? There will always need to be some level of monitoring to make sure that we don't get another annual grass monoculture back in there. Further down the road or going higher up in elevation, the cheatgrass falls out a little bit and you get more and more desirable sagebrush step plant communities where you have more native bunch grasses that have space around them so they're less likely to carry a fire. You've got healthy sagebrush. Um, for up there, it was determined that the only thing that we really needed was to create a fuel break. The, the vegetation is mostly in pretty good shape, so the, the treatment for that part of the, the fuel break was simply to mow. There needs to be an appreciation for the fact that this is a wilderness study area. You typically don't go in and use mechanical tools in a wilderness study area. Not only did we use mechanical tools because they were the appropriate tool for the ecological task at hand, but we did it in collaboration with Wilderness Advocacy Group in Oregon. And if you're going to do that, you're not going to do it overnight. Again, it comes down to trust. You've got to, you've got to have a big enough balance in your trust account 
that people are willing to move forward. And one of the ways that I think that ultimately comes to pass, of course, time and repeated positive interactions or just coming back to the table helps. But the other thing is adaptive management and that's where the monitoring co component comes back into the picture. The monitoring is one step along the process to make sure that we're, we're hitting our mark. Over the next several years, it'll be an adaptive management process that's going to be monitored by folks from Oregon State University Extension and the USDA Agricultural Research Service to determine whether or not our efforts have been effective. That's what the collaborative's committed to, and I think that that really helped the trust factor. In the absence of adaptive management, I don't think we would be doing a fire break in the Pueblos. We've had some real beneficial things come out of this that a lot of people don't even realize yet, you know. This is going to be a long-term process and having the collaborative behind it will help us be successful in the long run. It's going to be something that's going to be used other places in the country, I hope.